Good evening. <coughs> Hopefully everyone had a good weekend. All right, it looks like everything's going, going good now. So, all right, let me get started here. We're gonna move on to the next chapter. Um, and that is uh, chapter four in the book. I guess I should probably have a title for that, huh? <clears throat> for those of you who are following along, this is an introduction to a simple computer. Um, and we're going to, although we won't get to it tonight, but we are gonna start working on some of the Maria stuff. So, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about, like in general, kind of how some of the different components of a computer, and then I'll work my way up to um, uh, to a place where we're going to be able to start talking about Maria either next time or, or on Thursday, so sometime this week. So but the first three chapters are with the exam, and that exam will be next week. We will not, ha I will not do a, um, a, a video or lecture on Thursday of next week because that'll be your time to instead take the exam. Now I know this is asynchronous, which doesn't, which means you don't, you're not going to necessarily be attending that that time, but you don't have new material that day, so that gives you that extra hour and twenty minutes, two hours, something like that to work on the exam. Now some of you might take longer than that, but that's that's where we're at. Okay. Wanted to kind of get that out of the way. All right, so I put up assignment four. Um, I still have to yet to correct two and three. Um, I'm actually going to be starting on that as soon as I close tonight. We probably will get done early, so today will be a little bit shorter. But <clears throat> we'll uh, we'll come come to that when we can. So I'll be grading those. Um, hopefully, uh, starting tonight and maybe uh, finishing them up on Wednesday. Uh, Tuesdays just are not good for me as far as any extra time. All right, so let's talk about what makes up the computer. So let's start at the very central part of it, and that is the CPU. Right, I think most of you already know this is the central processing unit. Processing unit. And so it's important to note, I'm going to use the von Neumann structure here. We talked about that a little bit earlier. I'm going to use the classic von Neumann structure. However, you don't have to create a computer using this. You can break a lot of the other rules and switch things around. But that will be for you to figure out how to do that. And maybe we'll branch out and talk about it just a little bit from time to time. But I won't be uh, pressing that. Is the exam timed? And the answer is to that is no. The exam will not be timed. So I would expect most people to be able to get it done hard, really working on it for two hours. Um, although some people will take a lot more time than that if they don't, if they're not ready for it. You should be able to sit down and do most of it without resources. But uh, that's the hope, anyways. If you've done all the assignments and been tracking along, so that will also be my hope is that I can get assignment three uh, or assignment four graded as quickly as possible so that you'll have that feedback as well for uh, for the exam okay so so let me let me draw a really big picture of a CPU now there are three parts registers Um, yeah, so um, the resources you'll be able to use is anything that you have at your disposable, at your disposal. Uh, I would ask that you do not work with anyone else. Um, in fact, if I think that people are doing that, I will be pretty strict about it. Um, it hasn't been a problem on the assignments thus far, but uh, 
I would just ask that you make sure that you do it alone. That's the biggest thing. And I'm, I'm not going to monitor. You guys are going to have to monitor yourselves. Although, if I get, like, exact same answers for two from two different people, and it looks like they've been working together, um, then, then I will take action if I need to. Uh, yes, and it is in an assignment format, right? It'll just be a larger assignment. Uh, but you'll, and you'll be able to do it the exact same way. So ba basically, it's just going to be assignment with more work. And we'll see how it goes. I, I, I have no idea. I haven't administered a, a test like this before. So, uh, and maybe you haven't taken a test this way before, but my guess is you guys have been doing online stuff for longer than I have. So, <clears throat> We'll see how it goes, and uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, I figure um, since when you get to work, a, a workplace, right, when I'm working, I have access to anything, right? I can, I can even access other people. Uh, and so now, like I said, for exam, I'd ask you not to do that. But the, the reality is in the workplace, you don't have to do exams anymore. Um, and so if you get to the right answer and you had to look it up, I mean, yeah, it sucks, but that's the way it is, right? So hopefully you can kind of, some stuff will kind of stick in your brain as you go, um, cause that'll help you, uh, being able to, it's actually an interesting thing. Let me, let me take a break and talk about that for a second. Um, one of the things is, uh, with our brains, our brains are really a fa fascinating thing. But when you learn things, when you're first new at something, let, let's just say, for example, when you're first a new driver, and most of you can probably remember that time. Actually, I can still remember that time, and it's been 30 years. So uh, you weren't a good driver. You thought you were, but you weren't. You know, you can look back now and you say, oh, when I was 16 or 17 or 18, I just wasn't as good at things. And that's because you don't have the experience. You're also going to be far more tentative, and you're not going to be as decisive in your driving uh, because you just don't have that experience. You haven't gone through situations, right? Well, what do you do when the sun gets in your eyes? What do you, you know, you put your sunglasses on, right? Well, but you have other different things to cope with that, right? What do you do when there's that car that looks like it might want to pull out on the side road, but they're supposed to be stopped? You know, how do you interpret that? And those are little things that come that only experience can do for you. And so that's that's the hope here is that you get some experience with some of these things. And as you get more experience with them, that kind of cements them into your brain and how they work. So that's the same thing here when we're to talk about the inside of a CPU. Do you have to really know how this works? No. In the real world, probably not. But it is a different way of thinking about things. And it is a different way of the computer processing things. So... It will be second nature to you if you if you really take it seriously. And so that's what I ask you to do. Okay, so so registers, this is actually, I should, I should uh, talk about the difference between storage and memory because I don't want, want people to get mixed up here. Storage is what this is. Wait, no, no, I'm sorry, this is memory. Sorry, memory. This is memory, and it's probably not very much. Even on the very fastest computers, probably a megabyte, maybe 10, maybe maybe 20. It's not very much. Uh, in fact, let's look up a brand new, let's go up, uh, let's go to my favorite website, or we, at least one of them, um, Newegg, and let's look at a brand new, I don't want all this stuff, I don't want that. Um, let's look at um, CPU. Let's just look at a brand new CPU right here. Okay, I don't really care which one it is. What I want to do is I want to look at the specs for it because, aha, so this is actually interesting here. This tells me that this has 16 megabytes of L3 cache. So that's another word sometimes that's used for um, registers is cache and 
Does it have anything more? Is there any more information on this? Doesn't look like it. Uh, 16 threads, we'll talk about that, what that means. Eight cores, we'll talk about what that means. Unlocked and overclocked, we'll even touch upon overclocking, what that means. This is, we're gonna, we'll be able to go through a lot of these things here. Um, memory speed. That's an interesting, interesting thing to look at as well. All right, so does it have, that doesn't list an amount of cache here. That's okay. Okay, all right, let's go, go ahead and, I know I'm kind of being frantic on here, but, uh, this tells us something about it. Oh, yeah, okay. This tells us how fast it is. This is actually interesting. That's a clock speed. Um, that's some graphics card that's integrated into it and supported by, there we go. All right, so it's all good. And for the value of only $327.99. Okay, so, so, but memory is in here and there's different kinds of cache and uh, level one, L1, L2, and L3. And my guess is the one that we looked at there, it told us how much L3 there was, but it has a certain amount of L1 and L2. I'm not gonna talk about the difference between those two. Basically, the lower the number, the faster it is. <clears throat> and the more the more there are, the better, because it, it, uh, it'll be able to load more things into memory. All right, so, but the, the vast majority of this is registers and so in that one that we just looked at there's 16 megabytes here is that uh, 16 times 2 to the sixth or is it 16 times not 2 to the sixth, 10 to the sixth or 2 to the 20th it turns out that it really doesn't make that much difference. So we're just going to say it's 16 times 10 to the sixth. So 16 followed by six zeros. That's how many bytes there are, or 16 million. Okay, and then we have so right. So memory is just. It's places to, it's memory locations. So think about this as memory locations. And then the next one we have is the, uh, well, I'll do the ALU last. So then the next one is the control unit. I'm just gonna write control here. And it's not very big. And then we have the CPU, or the ALU, the Arithmetic Logic Units. Oh, ah, okay. So this is actually incorrect. This is not a good diagram. I just realized this. This is, make this a little bit bigger. But yeah, this is our register. So this would be L1 and L2. And this is the ALU. And so the ALU is actually the logic gates that we're going to send our uh, wiring, or our um, commands through. So, and this would be considered what, right, one CPU. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. Now I'm going to end up erasing some stuff here. At least. Drop this down.
because the next one we have is the arithmetic. Yeah, that's the arithmetic. Logic unit. Logic unit. So let's think about this for a second. The control unit, there's going to be this command that's going to come in, and part of that is going to tell the CPU what to do. And that's in, in um, binary form. So then we're going to pass that through a decoder, like the multiplexer, right? It's a sim very, very similar thing. So we'll take this and combine it in, and it will send out one thing. It'll say, you're the one who's active. And so it'll send that. There'll be a big collection of different things to do in the ALU. And each system's going to be different and how many there are. And this control is going to decide which of those gets activated. Now, this isn't exactly to size or to scale. Because I have writing here I don't really want to get rid of. So this is ALU number two. So this is largely what's going to go on. So if we go back to this, right, we noticed here, did it say how many cores are in there? Eight cores. Usually, usually, they were put in like this. So that you can have a connection here, a connection here, a connection here, a connection here, and a connection to there. And I'll talk about how those get connected here in a second. But usually these have direct connections to each other. They don't necessarily have to, but just for speed's sake, that's usually what they're going to do. Now, in multi-core systems, this is usually the way it goes. It's two cores uh, are supported in one CPU, and so then there would be four of them, four pairs inside the computer. And then between those pairs, there's going to be a block of L3 cache. And that's what it was talking about. That's their 16 megabytes. So there'll be this, this here, CPU 1. And there's going to be over here, although it looks smaller, it really is the same size. So this is CPU 2. And then 3. And then 4. And all of these will have a single connection to the cache. And it's interesting because everything in these CPUs always goes through the control unit first. So if I want to take something out of L3 cache and put it into L2 cache or L1 cache because I want it closer, then uh, actually I think... I think if I remember correctly, this is all L2. And L1 is actually embedded inside of the ALUs. But we're not, I'm not going to worry about what the, the different layers are. But this is L, the L3 I'm positive is outside. So <clears throat> everything goes through the control unit. So let's say I want to take something out of L3, bring it into the, through the control unit, load it into, L2, into the L2 registry somewhere. Um, and ultimately, everything needs to be loaded that way. Um, and that's something you can, you'll study in, in operating systems and in a little bit greater detail. Uh, because what's going to happen is your program's just going to run through a bunch of registers. And once it gets done, then it's going to go back to the top and do it again. It's not exactly always what happens, but that's a way to think about it. Okay. But this is just how the things are connected internally, right? We have to w have a way to connect. 
So let's just call this whole thing here. We're gonna we're gonna call this whole thing our, our greater CPU. Or we're just gonna use the word CPU. Because usually these are like I said, they're it's not really a separate CPU, but it's a separate core, I guess is a better way to say it. This whole CPU. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create this CPU. Now CPU here has all four parts in there, all four of those core clusters. So this is our CPU. But then also we have, on modern computers, well, we have a storage, right? That's a hard drive. It could be a disk drive, it could be you know, network drive or something like that. So then we have network, interf ne network interface, card. A lot of times that's embedded into the motherboard. We're going to have maybe a monitor. Let me let me move that down a little bit here. A monitor. Maybe a keyboard. Maybe a mouse. Some kind of a printer. So we have to connect all of these things together. So one of the things we could do is we could just run wires between all of them. Bling, 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 done. Because sometimes the CPU needs to talk to the network interface card, and sometimes it needs to talk to the keyboard, and sometimes it needs to talk to the mouse. That'd be great, but that'd be a big mess. And every time you add a new thing, I have to add in wires between that new thing and everything else that exists. Terrible way to do it. It doesn't expand very well. It doesn't scale. So what we what they did is they introduced, let me use blue, let me use green actually. They introduced this thing in the middle called the bus. And then that's connected to the bus, and this is connected to the bus, and this is connected to the bus. And so are, is everything else. So everything is just simply connected to the bus. And we can think of these lines in here are the exact same way. Okay? So all the things that I'm going to talk about for the bus and how it works, we can use in the exact same way positions here. <clears throat> okay. So the bus in the bus, so what it's going to do is it's, it sends one word, which consists of uh, many different bytes. In fact, actually, let's look back here at our thing here. Let's see if we can ascertain what the bus size is. Uh, that's, nope, that's something LGA. Uh, hmm, nope, doesn't say there. So it doesn't say, well, let me get down here to the specifications. Uh, or is that, that's similar products. I don't want similar products. There's the Wi-Fi on it. Um, Intel Smart Cache, that's great. Uh, nope, nope, memory speed. Well, that's fine, that doesn't help me any. This is RAM, by the way. That's kind of the next thing out. That's a different form of memory. Ah, actually, we need to put that in our diagram. Um, please, uh, nope, does not say what our bus speed is. And over time, it's actually changed 
they've actually changed kind of whether or not they talk about that or not because the um, ah, we need to put another thing on here don't we and that is RAM because that other memory I'm talking about is not RAM so there's RAM and it connects to the bus as well and there'll be a little piece of software inside of each of these that'll help it be able to interface with the to be able to interact with the bus properly okay so this bus consists of a whole bunch of different wires yeah they're still wires they're just clustered together probably 64 or 128 and so uh, what it is is actually it's the word size of whatever your operating system is that's a way to think about it uh, or that's one way they classify it uh, so this this bus has certain number of wires or lines for the address right so address lines data lines and control lines and I'll talk a little bit about what those mean and what they can do here so here's here's the thing is that When the monitor, uh, well, let me back up. Because, yeah, you, you can add a lot of other things. I, I guess the graphics card, I didn't put that on here and some of the other things. But let's say the CPU, right, has some information to put, to uh, to send. So this is a hard drive. Hard drive. And my penmanship sucks. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So let's say a, a mouse gets clicked on this computer. So what this needs to do is it needs to send a message to the CPU of what just happened. And so what it'll do is it generates something that on the control lines, right, it ha in its control lines it says, hey, this is the mouse, and I need to send a message to the CPU. And here's the message in the data lines. And then the address lines probably aren't used in that case. So the mouse just fires off this event and it sends it out to everyone. So anybody can get it. But the printer says, I don't need to worry about something the mouse is telling me because I don't need to worry about it. And so it forgets about it, doesn't care. And so then that information comes into the CPU. Then the CPU will generate some kind of action it needs to take based on that mouse click. Rather there's any action to take or not but then the CPU figures that out and that's part of part of what happens internally here and then it will send out a message to the monitor probably through the graphics card to telling it how to change the screen <clears throat> and that just that happens with every single mouse, mouse click so it gets uh, there's a lot of traffic there are lots and lots and lots of things that are going to happen just because one mouse click happened now, it's possible that there are very few things, right? Because the mouse click might not have done anything. <clears throat> but depends on, right? Maybe it maybe it maybe it did something, maybe it didn't. Okay. Now <clears throat> Okay, so because of all the CPUs, we can think inside of our CPU. I'm going to draw another diagram. And this will probably be more accurate. I'll try to get this all in one screen here so we can we can see it there. Okay. I need to, I don't need to, okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to have this bus. Now, this is the whole thing. The whole thing is the CPU.
Alright, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a control here. Or one. Core two. And if there was room, I'd put them all in the same line. Core three. And they're all the exact same size. So think of these, right, is ALUs, although they can be more than that. So this is on this bus. So this is this is a and then over here. Remember, in each of these there's a certain amount of L2. L2 and L1 cache. So this is L the L3 cache should be over here. Oops. And so this could be a, a, um, a bus that's going inside the processor here that allows the control unit to be able to control multiple different cores. And instead of being connected like with these lines, it's really connected more like this. And so then like core one, if, a, if the control unit sends out a message to control two, or core two, I'm sorry, to core two, then core one just ignores it. And that's a way to do things. We'll talk a little bit more. And so more likely here, this, this yeah, so this is actually going to be the IO bus. So we can split those two things up because we don't need the mouse clicks to be interfering with what's going on inside the processor. And so sometimes that'll be two buses like that, and I think most modern computers do. So this would be a process bus. And I just I just gave it as, a, as an example here that these cores are going to be connected. The, arc, the actual architecture might be completely different than this. But we can just assume that it's going to look something like this. Okay. Now, I want to talk about something that you guys probably understand the meaning of. Oops. Synchronous. At the same time. And then asynchronous. at different times so just like this class right it's not synchronous right we could so people can view the lectures they don't have to view it live and then it disappears right so <clears throat> just like you know I look here and I can see how many people are in there and it is not the full uh, full number of people in the course we're talking 18 people in the course. So, uh, but we do have the synchronous versus the asynchronous. Uh, so, so at the same time. Okay, so wh what does that mean? When it applies... to synchronous. 
So there's different methods to, to get these buses to work. So people have innovated over the time. At the beginning, they just use a real simple thing like, hey, I have a message to send to the, C the control unit, and so I just send that message out, and then everyone else has to be quiet. So first I might announce, hey, I'm going to send something, and everyone else says, okay, and they agree, and then they let me go, and then I'm going to get a chance. And there's different ways to do that. We'll talk about them just a little bit here. Oh, that's right. You guys can't see my mouse. I figured that out, actually. So I, I'm like pointing at stuff, but you guys can't see it. So actually, I need to do this. So when I'm saying this, I need to like draw this, right? So this is t trying to send a message. So, <clears throat> so I have to ask for permission that everyone else is going to be quiet. And so if everyone else agrees, then nobody else talks on the bus, and then, the, then I can send that, that message to control unit you know, like I was asking. That's certainly one way to do it. Uh, that's not the only way. There's a lot of other ways. We'll, like I said, we'll talk about it here in a second. Um, the same thing would apply here, right? So, okay. Synchronous means at the same time, which means that I'm going to send out a message to every uh, to things at the same time. Now, there are asynchronous systems, which means it's not at the same time. Now, what that means is there's probably somebody sitting there, there's another little thing sitting there, listening to the bus. Or maybe everything has a, every one of these things that are connected to the bus has a little thing that's listening to it. And what happens is, is it doesn't accept it, it can't process it right away, but what it does is it can hang on to it. And so it will send it when the first opportunity happens. When the first opportunity comes about that it can use the line. So that's how asynchronous would work. Uh, almost never is a processor bus asynchronous. You just never would do it that way. Because you control, right, because you're creating that. The, the company creates those cores and the control units and the L, everything. So it's going to keep it exactly the same. Now, however, this is where it gets a little tricky, is in the I.O. bus. What happens if the keyboard uses a certain style of bus, of being able to access the bus? So it has a different, a certain, um, yeah, certain way of accessing the bus. And that's different than the way the mouse is accessing the bus. So different, what's called a handshaking method. If those are different, then then the bus is it, it can be it can be very interesting. It slows things down. The good news is we don't have to worry about that anymore. Most of these things are very very standardized, but they're not necessarily standardized. They don't have to be. Uh, I can't think of a single situation. Well, I can, actually. If you buy some RAM that's for Apple computer and you try putting it into a PC, it won't work. That's just an example. Um, there's also different levels of RAM. Uh, and so you, like DDR and um, DDR2 and DDR3 and DDR4. I think that's the only levels, but I'm not positive. It's been a few years since I've looked, so they might have more. But uh, that's pa partially what that's talking about is how does it interact with the bus. So you could plug it in, but it wouldn't interact with the bus properly if you put the wrong thing in. It just simply wouldn't work. In fact, it probably might melt something, so I would not suggest doing it. All right. Ah, so this requires some kind of a handshaking method.
Um, yeah, I'm going to call it a method, but we could also call it a process. It doesn't... Okay. So let me describe that, and I'm just going to describe it in words. Let me try to do an analogy that makes some sense. I don't know if people still do this. I don't know if any people ever did it. But used to pass notes maybe in classes. Well, and actually probably people nowadays just text each other in with their phones in their pockets or whatever and figure it out. But, okay, so let's... Uh, yeah, th that's a good way to think about it. Okay. What you're going to do... The first thing you're going to do, usually in a hand, some kind of a handshaking message, you're going to broadcast to everyone that you have a message to send, and you're going to tell you who you're going to who you're going to send it to. And you can detect whether or not somebody else is talking on the line at the same time, right? So you check the line. You say, "Hey, is anybody talking on the bus?" You look at it. You just look at the bus, listen to the bus. Nobody else is talking in the bus. So then what you do is you basically, it's like you're yelling into the, the hallway, hey, I have a message to send. Everyone be quiet. And so the now everyone knows to be quiet so that you can send a message. And there's ways to deal with that. Um, the collisions that happen, right? If, if two people stick their heads out and yell at the same time, you have to deal with that. Who gets priority? And so... <clears throat> all right so uh but let's just just assume no detect no no collisions happen at all so you yell out hey i have something to say <clears throat> and so then you get up you probably are going to get an all clear because there's going to be somebody say there there's a little piece of hardware that's sitting there just listening to the bus saying giving people permission to talk so you just you, you stick your head out and you yell, "Hey, I want to have something to say," and so then the the thing that's that's telling you what you or when you can say things says, "Go ahead, uh, door number five, whatever number it is." And so then at that point you can send your information. Now it might depending on the the method that we use, you might only get uh, so many messages, like so many words that you can send down the bus at a time. Or you might be able to send all the information until you're done. Who knows, uh, right? It depends on it depends on the system. So then, uh, but it allows the asynchronous allows things to be different. So that it could talk be talking you so. So think about it in this way, really, is that you could step to the doorway and you could yell out in English, please, I need to t say something. But somebody else farther down the line, they could be opening that door and they could stick their head out and they could yell in French. And the thing that is giving people permission knows how to talk to each of you in your own language. That's, just, that's a good way to frame it. And so... You could hear, hey, no one else was speaking at that time. And so that's how you detect if there's a collision or not. But if you detect that somebody else was speaking, then you'll wait a certain amount of time, and then you'll speak it again. But everybody has a different wait time, so that the person that's the French speaker and the English speaker are going to wait different amounts of time before they request the bus again. So that way the, the likelihood of them collision, colliding again is really low. Okay, so, so then you get the information. Now, say this French, this French speaker can now speak French on that line and send that to wherever it needs to go to because that other entity can interpret the French. And then when it's your turn, you can speak English. And so that's that's kind of how asynchronous works. So you'll see it a lot of times on IO lines, but you won't necessarily see it on a processor because you have control and everybody can speak the same language. R whatever that language is, right? you could make it ancient e Egyptian. It doesn't matter, right? So, uh, or Latin. 
uh, or you could use Klingon for, for that matter. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, so, uh, and, and those are analogies only, right? Because there actually isn't, on that level, when we're talking about the bus level, it's not actual languages like we would think about. Okay, so, uh, ah, okay, so let me, let me talk then here a little bit about bus arbitration. And maybe some of you have heard this word before. The, the probably the the usually the way it's portrayed or or the way the context that I've heard it in is in contract disputes. So <clears throat> this could be a sports contract, right? A player maybe wants to get paid more. They always always want to get paid more, right? Well, so does everyone else, right? So I don't blame them for that. And the team wants to pay them less, and so they go they go to a situation called arbitration, where a third person then figures out uh, what the salary is going to be, and th that happens in baseball actually fairly often. I don't know how much how much it happens in any other sport. Maybe uh, I'm not exactly sure. So, <clears throat> but you could also have that in the business world as well, right? If there's some kind of a conflict between two entities, you might send something to arbitration, which would mean a third party comes in and makes a decision for you. But the way that it means here, let's actually look this up, because this is actually, this is a good one. Um, arbitration. Define. All right. The use of an arbiter to settle a dispute. Hmm. <laughs> That's nice. That's, that's <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, so right. That's that's exactly what I was saying, right? So arbitration. So it's what the use the use of a third party or a, of somebody who's going to make the decision to just settle the dispute. Okay. So what dispute are we settling in bus arbitration? The dispute is who gets to speak. On the line currently. This is who. Uh, instead of speak, I'm going to say who gets to go uh, when there is a conflict. All right. The first one. So we could, we'll say this one is daisy chain. I'm not exactly sure why they call it daisy chain. Daisy train arbitration. So normally what a daisy chain would mean is that A is connected to B, B is connected to C, C is connected to D, D is connected to E, and right on down the line. And you might wrap it back around again, you might not. So uh, it, it means that everything is connected one to the next one, and that if you want to get a message from one to eight, it has to go through everybody else. Now this isn't what this means. This just means that everybody is connected in in uh, in what amounts to a daisy chain? Let me, let me let me explain. So we could think of it as a daisy chain, where one is connected kind of to the the top, and that everybody has an order. So, but this in this case, an abstract. So it's it's a uh, in our thought space, it's an order. And so what happens is we say all devices. get a priority and then comma huh 
highest highest priority goes first. And usually we'll say all devices get a unique priority, which means that everybody gets a different priority number. And then it just so so it'd be it would be like, right, if everyone in the class got a number and that when one of you have a question, you raise your hand and then if there are multiple people who are raising their hand, I'll go with whatever person has the highest number. Now, my guess is in real life that doesn't happen very often, but in a computer it does happen fairly often because conflicts are normal. So there's a disadvantage. To, there's an advantage to this. One is it's always fast so that what I can do is, remember I talked about how long you have to wait, right? If the, there's an English person and the French person are both talking at the same time, then both of them wait a certain amount of time before they rebroadcast, before they re-ask to get the bus. Now, if your priority is high, like, like if you know you're the highest priority in the, in the land, then you don't wait at all. And then you just simply say, nope, it's mine, I get it, and, and you ask again. Immediately, you don't have to, you don't have to wait at all. So the advantage to this is things that are high priority always get the bus right away, usually very quickly. And that's great. The problem is, is in a really busy system, the things that are low priority never get a chance to go. That's bad. So in a congested system, this would be a bad way to do things. No, normally we don't have to worry about that because we're talking such astronomically fast times. Okay, yeah, okay, good. All right, so then number two. Ah, called central parallel. Parallel. Um. So when we talk about our, our analogy of the English and the French, there's one of them has a higher priority than the other. So if they both ask at the same time, one has a higher priority. That gives us our daisy chain. A control. So the second one says that in uh, central parallel, so everyone gets to ask whenever they want, but a control unit decides. So that means there's another entity, you can think of that as a piece of software somewhere, that's sitting at, in the hallway, and it's just listening to the hallway, it's listening to that bus, and it, when there's a conflict, it picks between the English and the French, and it says, okay, French, you get to go, or English, you get to go. So that gives us that gives us there's something else that controls it. Okay. Then we have a distributed distributed central parallel arbitration. All right, so what this says is there isn't a designated control unit. All devices
we can think about it. They would know, they know how to choose. I'm going to use, I'm going to borrow a word from up here, how to choose priority. So instead of the central process, the central control unit, instead of that control unit knowing how to decide who's going to go, this is different than daisy chain because the priorities can change. And that's where it's important. So you're not always going to be first. The English isn't always first. The French isn't always first. So maybe in a distributed parallel or central parallel, uh, it, it says, okay, well, English... Or last time, you know, the last time the uh, French had the had the bus most recently. So then English gets it this time, and then they get it only for a certain time chunk. So they don't get to monopolize it. They just get it for a certain amount of time, and then then they have then they send a all clear, I'm done, and then now the French can jump in, and then when the French is done, then it says all clear, and it gets the same kind of a time chunk, and then anyone who wants to talk again. And maybe the English or maybe the French have to ask again, but the Japanese could also step in and say, hey, we want to talk now too. Right? So, or, 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 or a second English, right? It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be a different language. And I'm using that as a stand-in again. I'm using the English, the different languages, as a stand-in between different kinds of protocols. So different ways to speak across the line that maybe others wouldn't understand. So this says there's some kind of a way to choose, right? The central parallel one has the same thing, but instead of having a special piece of software, there's a little bit of software on all of the devices that help them decide if it's their turn or if it's somebody else's turn. And then the last one is distributed. Oh, I spelt this wrong, didn't I? Distributed central processing unit, so CP, with collision detection. And there's lots of different ways to do this too. So this this just will be able to uh, decide if there's a collision or two people are talking at the same time. And when that happens, then it, it the the strategy is allowed to be able to figure that out. Okay. So let's talk then about one more subject, and that is. We talked about it a little bit before when we were doing our flip-flops, but let's do this. Internal clock. Let's go back to our example. Operating frequency. This tells you the clock speed. This tells you that this will, this is on the CPU, not on the bus, so it's a little different. This tells you how many different times the control unit can do something and pass that and, and can, can, how quickly can the control unit do things and assign it out to other thing, other people. That's kind of one way to think about it. So how quickly can it do that? In this case, we get uh, 3.5 billion hertz. Well, one hertz would be one time per second. So in this case, we get 3.5 billion operations per second. This is why the higher the, the, the frequency, 
in this case, right? The higher this operating frequency is, the faster it is. So this is internal inside of this CPU can operate at 3.4. Uh, here's another one that operates at 2.5 or 3.5, sorry, not. And then this one operates at 2.5. So this one would be, you know, a third faster. Okay. So we can really think of this also sometimes as the system clock. Here's the interesting thing. That's actually pretty cool. It's actually really cool to learn how that works. And I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to go look up. It's actually really neat. So the system clock is how fast things can happen inside the CPU. This would be inside the CPU. And then we have also, we have a bus clock. And this is the bus's speed. So usually these are measured in gigahertz, but let's see, can I, instead of looking up this, can I just look up a, I want to look up a notebook computer. Let's see if it can do that for me. Ah, oh, very good. Okay, let's just pick one here, this Lenovo laptop. Okay, so that's the processor it has, and that's the speed that processor can run at, 3.8 gigahertz. This is how much RAM it has. That's our memory. Uh, that's our graphics, and that's the size of the screen. And that, okay, that's all great and good, but let's look down and see if there's some more specifications on this. It's gonna give me any more. Um, CPU speed, throughput memory, no hard drive. That's too bad. Oh, it doesn't have a, a regular hard drive, but it has an SSE drive. Solid state drive. That's actually way better. Uh, not a touch screen. And there's some buying options. So no more specs on it. Just missing a tab or something. There's got to be some place I can click on. Nope. Ah, here's specs. Here we go. Okay, brand quick. Um, operating system, screen, storage, video card, dimensions, weight, height. Okay, here we go. Here's our CPU speed. The core name is a Tiger Lake number of cores. It's quad core. So there's four. This is how much cache there is. Actually, that's nice. It tells us uh, the memory which I believe is out here. Yep, 16 gigabytes DDR4, but I have 12 megabytes of cache, L3 cache. That's operating systems, graphics, storage, memory, operating communications, nope, ports. These are all important. Input devices, general, power. Eh, it doesn't have anything about the bus. Not one thing about the bus. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, not a single thing about it. Well, that's a bummer. That's a real bummer. Let's do a find on the page. Can I get a bus? Can I find a bus? It found, a, found four of them. I'm not seeing it though. Okay, there's business, business. Not sure where that one is highlighting. That's probably the same kind of thing. I'm not seeing where it highlights, where it's highlighting. Hmm. 
All right. In any case, we're not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Any oh, there's a business right there. Then I go down to this next one. Should be right on the top of the screen. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm not seeing it. That's okay. All right. So sometimes it'll tell you the speed of the bus. Um, it used to be a problem. For a while, it was a problem because they needed to increase the speed of their, the bus. And so then it would list it so that you could tell if it was the faster version or the slower version. We don't have that problem anymore in the newer computers, evidently. Otherwise, it would be listing it. Okay. So then I'm going to talk about one more term today, and that is the word overclocking. This is the this is making a system go faster. It's not a perfect definition. Um, you can look it up for yourselves for to see for overclocking and exactly, but I'm going to give you the idea of it. <clears throat> I have overclocked a computer. It's been very many years since I did that. Uh, I overclocked some of my RAM. Uh, it's probably been 10 years since I did that. It turned out it did help my performance a bit, but not, not a, it wasn't enough to make a difference to me. Okay, so that's the reason why I haven't done it since then. So... What it does is, is that you're going to speed it up, right? So if we go back, oh, did I close that? No, I, no, I didn't. Okay. Oh, I just brought it over here. But I want to go back a page. Or two. Okay, go back to here. Right, so this tells us what that speed is, that, that front side bus, right? The specs, specs, specs. Give me the specs, come on. There we go. All right, so this told me, didn't it? Number of threads, frequency. Okay, so this is operating, it's 3.5 gigahertz. I could overclock this. I could make it go four, 4.0, which means more things would go through the, the processor faster. Here's the problem. Every time the, which actually applies to the Moore's Law, and I don't talk about that too much when I talked about Moore's Law, but it, it applies in Moore's Law as well. When the electricity runs down the line, runs down a wire, if anyone has ever grabbed a, a wire, a bare wire, and gotten a shock from it, you know that it's hot. It has heat to it. You can actually even, if you... If you have electrical wire that has the casing around it, the shielding around it, sometimes you could hang on to that wire and you can feel that it's hot. And you can feel that it's hot because there's a lot of electricity running through that. Oh, hey, this has the bus speed. That's actually cool. Okay. So, but I could overclock this CPU. Or I could make the, the bus speed go a little faster. The problem is, is that's going to generate more heat. And that heat needs to be pulled away from the computer. So, my friends and I, once or twice a year, COVID's kind of messed up the cycle, but I think we're going to get back onto it here in a minute, and, and the, later next month, is that we have a LAN party a couple times a year. And... It wasn't a, it would, that wasn't seen as a successful LAN party unless somebody smoked their computer because a lot of us were overclocking things, um, and for and particularly one uh, one guy, he liked to overclock everything. Well, and when when you're just going to use your computer for an hour, it's not so big a big of a deal. But when you're going to use your at a LAN party, you might be using your computer for 16 hours straight, playing fairly highly intensive games, and so. 
it really taxes that and gets the speed up really super high. So, uh, or and it'll get the heat up, and then you won't be able to pull the heat off the computer, and it smoked it. In fact, I were, uh, more than once he he smoked a graphics card because he had overclocked it. That's part of the reason. So you do run a danger when you're overclocking, and the danger is because of the heat that gets up too high. Um, I know that's a lot of material um, and a lot of just definitions and talking about different things. And I, I don't even know what there is on here to, to try to test for. Um, but uh, well, maybe a little bit. Right? I can talk about what does this look like, what does that look like. So normally, if I, if you, if I ask you a question about the CPU, I'm going to ask for this part of the CPU here. Just one core in there. And you don't have to worry about L2 or L any of those Ls. Wait. Oh, yeah. L3 versus L2 cache. Not the cache. Cache. So, uh, tech target. Eh. I don't care about you. Um, Cache member, some go CPU memory because it's typically integrated directly into the CPU. That's actually great. This is a nice little article to read. Uh, in order to be close to the prior cache member, it means small, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is a great article. Okay, here we go. Primary cache is extremely fast but relatively small and is usually embedded in the processor unit as a CPU cache. So if I go back here. Inside of here, L1. Is that right? It says inside of the processor. Is often called more copious than uh, may be embedded on the CPU or it can be on a separate chip or coprocessor. So that's this typically. Typically, this will be then L2, and then L3 will be out here, outside. And that's what this is saying. Especially uh, developed to improve the performance of 1 and 2. It's significantly, f uh, usually double the speed of RAM. Uh, each core can have dedicated, uh, but they can share L3. So that's, that's, uh, typically what will happen, right? Each one of the cores will have its own L1 and L2. A lot of times, not always, but a lot of times you'll see two ALUs inside of a CPU. Uh, and that allows, that's why you can get, in, it only has eight cores on it maybe, but you can get 16 threads. And we'll talk about what that means in the future. Uh, but this that's a great article. I like that article. Let me do this. Copy. Close this. Go down here. How do I? There we go. So I put that link in there. Um, that should should come through. But that's a really nice nice uh, tech link to to talk about uh, memory. There. All right. that's all that I've got so um, we'll come back on Wednesday and we will talk some more about a little bit more about the, the CPU and kind of how that works and then then we'll move on and and talk about Maria and uh, we'll, we'll start getting into some of that shortly okay that's everything I will uh, I'll talk to you all on Wednesday